Our next speaker is Kelly Hunter Foster. Uh, she is a legal and policy expert with more than 27 years of combined experience in government and nonprofit sectors. Throughout her career, she has remained dedicated to serving the public and protecting the environment. First as Assistant Attorney General and Chief of the Environmental Protection Unit of the Oklahoma Attorney General's Office, and currently as the Senior Attorney at Waterkeeper Alliance. Kelly is frequently asked to consult or speak on the Clean Water Act, CAFOs, AFOs, and her expertise has been relied on and is reflected in major policy and legal developments. Please join me in welcoming Kelly. So I'm Kelly Hunter Foster. I'm a, as she mentioned, I'm a senior attorney at Waterkeeper Alliance. Um, Waterkeeper Alliance, as you may or may not know, um, is a global organization. There are more than 300 waterkeepers working around the world um, on water quality issues. And in the United States, there are more than 150. And one of the reasons that we have um, a campaign at Waterkeeper Alliance that's focused on animal feeding operations is that they are a major water quality problem, not just in the United States, but almost everywhere in the United States, um, and also in multiple places around the world as our industrial model has spread um, throughout the world. And so um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about AFOs and CAFOs today, and at the last minute, I also decided to throw in slaughterhouses because it's a timely topic right now. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best, in the, and I tend to go on and on about this, so I'm gonna do my best to cover what I can in 30 minutes and hit both of those topics to give you a sense about the issue nationally, um, also a little bit focused in on New York, and a couple of opportunities for you all, if you're interested, to be able to engage at the federal level and hopefully let them know that this really matters um, and that they need to maybe be doing a little bit better job with regard, well, honestly, a lot better job uh, with regard to, to CAFOs and AFOs. One of the things I like to start with when I'm talking about this is that um, historically we've sort of thought of uh, as CAFOs as being this solitary thing and not tended to think about it as an industry. As, part, as a piece of an industry. Um, and so I like to talk a little bit about some of the pieces of this industry. Um, one of the, the primary places where it starts is animal feed production, which happens in the middle of the country um, and turns out it has become a large part of agriculture. It's just producing all this feed for all of this, um, all of this production that we're doing through this more industrial style model. Um, the next piece would be the breeding facilities and the production facilities. Both of those fall into being called AFOs and CAFOs. So what is an AFO? It just means it's a um, confinement facility where animals um, are kept and raised and there are not crops or other things within the building, basically. So. That's an animal feeding operation. And um, a CAFO is defined by federal regulations adopted by the EPA. So CAFOs are larger AFOs. Um, they have different size thresholds that they have to meet to become a CAFO. Not that they're striving to become one, but um, uh, different size thresholds apply to different types of animals, and then they also have to discharge in various ways. And when they do, they become subject to regulation under the Clean Water Act, which is um, supposed to control their discharges, but um, has pretty much failed at, at doing that. Not necessarily because the standards are wrong, but because a lot of animal feeding operations that qualify as CAFOs are not getting permits at all. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those numbers as we go through the presentation. So we have um, production through this more industrial style uh, model increasing such that we have doubled production of livestock and, and related um, things like dairy. Through this method, we, 
we've doubled our production since the 1950s, but the number of farms have decreased um, by 80% over that same time period. So we're producing beef and dairy and swine and eggs and poultry, all kinds of poultry, using this method now. Um, we're at the point where we have um, more than 450,000 animal feeding operations in the United States. And about 21,000 of those are large CAFOs that should be regulated under the Clean Water Act to control their pollution, but are typically evading that system altogether through a number of ways. Um, this shift to this production method has resulted in increased energy and water usage, um, air pollution, particularly impacting um, rural and, and environmentally vulnerable communities all across the country. Um, when you start working on these issues, you, you engage with people who are badly harmed um, and uh, in terrible ways by living in relation to some of these large CAFOs. Um, we have uh, increased drinking water treatment costs. We have increased greenhouse gas emissions. We have an increase in antibiotic resistant disease because when you house animals in tight proximity, you gotta give them antibiotics, the same antibiotics that we need to protect ourselves, but because they're been, being used on this scale, it is uh, reducing the effectiveness of our antibiotics to, to protect humans and also resulting in the um, release of antibiotic resistant bacteria into the environment again, in, in vulnerable communities often. Um, you can see from this map on this slide that these things are concentrated geographically in various parts of the country. If I broke it apart, you'd see poultry in this part of the country like Georgia or Arkansas. Um, you'd see dairy in some place like New York um, or California, Washington State. Um, you'd see swine in North Carolina, Ohio, You'll see a little bit of them in lots of different places, but we get these areas of concentration. And the reason we get that concentration is because these facilities concentrate around slaughterhouses or other processing. And so, you know, they need this means of production to get, you know, their animals or the milk or whatever it is to their actual processing plants. And um, because of that, because of the nature of the way they've structured this industry, we get lots of waste being produced in a very tight area. And um, what we used to do, and, and still do unfortunately, with animal waste is put it on the ground and reuse it in our farms. And so they're, they're doing that with all of this waste that's being generated, but the waste is different for one thing. The waste they're producing in confinement is, is more concentrated and it is uh, uh, home to those pathogens that I was talking about and some of them antibiotic resistant. But the, the, the thing that has been a, a known problem since at least 2001 is the waste is imbalanced such that the phosphorus content of this waste is so much higher than the nitrogen content that they are producing, uh, even in 2001, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture found that 60% of the nitrogen in manure produced through these systems and 70% of the phosphorus was um, in excess of what they need for the cropland around them, sometimes even on a whole county scale. And, now, and, and really, that was in 2001, and the problem has gotten much worse since then. And what happens is you get a buildup of these things like nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil over time, and they keep going up and up, it starts seeping through the soil profile, especially where it's um, shallow groundwater, it scoots through and gets into um, streams through ditches and tile drains, um, and it also runs off. And the problem with phosphorus too is once you get it in the soil, it's really, really hard to get it out of that soil it stays high for a really long time and becomes this continuing source of pollution. Um, and it's also really, really hard to get it out of the water. If you contaminate a lake or a reservoir with phosphorus to the point that it's become, that it's having toxic algae blooms or it's devoid of oxygen, um, that, 
phosphorus is in the sediment and it lives there and it's really hard to do anything about it, which is why we need to do a better job of um, some preventative work. Okay. So they, they're producing it, a lot of this waste in a concentrated area. Um, there's an estimate from EPA from a few years ago that, that APHOs are producing 1.1 billion tons of manure annually, probably more. That's a lot of waste. And they don't typically treat it. Um, what happens is it gets put in a lagoon like the one in this picture. Most of the time, in most places, there's no liner. They say there's a liner. They'll say it's a soil liner. Um, and, and, and they're allowed to leak at a certain rate. Depends on what state you're in, but NRCS will set the standard um, for how much it can leak. Um, even in places where they do actually require a plastic or an HDPE liner, they still, you know, leak. And this waste is not getting treated, and then, like in that picture up at the top on this slide, it's sprayed on the land, or it's spread on the land and using a, um, a spray truck or some other method. And um, because of the fact that we have known since 2001, as I mentioned, that these, this industry is producing so much more waste than they need for the crops. And because they're doing that through contracts with typically formerly independent farmers who don't have the resources to solve this industry's waste problem, the USDA and the EPA have allowed the standards to permit excessive waste application. They'll set the standards for the waste application based on how much the crops need for nitrogen. They'll ignore the pathogens, but they'll set them based on nitrogen. And when you do that, depending on what kind of CAFO waste you're talking about, you might be playing six times the amount of waste that you need every year. And it, it is a problem that only the, the big companies that are behind this CAFO system can solve. And they're not going to solve it unless somebody like the EPA or the NRCS is willing to actually hold them to the standards that all the other farmers need. You land apply what you need to grow crops and no more. You don't dump it on the ground and when you know it's gonna run off or leach into the groundwater. But that's not where we are. Similarly, I, I hate to be so depressing. Similarly, <laughs> oh, slaughterhouses. Slaughterhouses are a, a huge problem. Slaughterhouses rendering plants and similar um, uh, meat and poultry processing facilities are the number one and number two sources of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution in the, in the United States, industrial. They're massive sources. And the reason they're massive sources is because, again, EPA has not established standards, which we establish for every other industry, um, uh, that adequately limit their pollution. They're regulated under the Clean Water Act. They have to get permits. But EPA has not updated the standards for slaughterhouses and rendering plants for almost 20 years. And some of them are even older than that. And EPA has not placed any limits on the amount of phosphorus that these facilities can discharge. So, you know, given the fact that, that EPA has recognized for quite some time that phosphorus and nitrogen and, and the resulting nutrient pollution They've called it a national crisis. And they've urged the states to do something. And they've put all of this federal funding into voluntary practices. But what they're not doing is implementing the Clean Water Act provisions, which they're supposed to implement, to put limits on the sources. That's the vision of the Clean Water Act. Limit pollution at the source. And until we do that, we're going to have a problem. And one of the things about um, slaughterhouses is 3,700 of the 3,800 um, slaughterhouses in the United States discharge indirectly through city wastewater treatment systems. And without any limits on those, they're putting all that burden onto our cities. And again, just like with CAFOs, because cities, often overly burdened cities, don't have the money to pay for the industry's treatment, they end up without any limits in their permits. And so that pollution is just getting passed through. 
And I'm gonna talk to you if I don't talk too long and run out of time about an opportunity to engage with EPA on this. To give you a sense of how massive this industry is, um, there's a map of them. There's a lot. A lot of unregulated pollution sources. And I, I just think that most people don't realize that this, this long after the Clean Water Act that we have all of these sources that are really not being controlled. Okay. What the water quality impact slide. Um, I feel like I've kind of talked about this since I since I've just you know throwing it in, sprinkling it in. But these are kind of the main pollutants that we see: pathogens, nitrogen, phosphorus, organic matter, um, but also metals and pesticides are a concern. Not really focused on in any of the regulatory stuff. We get um, nationwide. We have a problem with algal blooms and algal toxins, harmful algal blooms. Um, that's because we aren't controlling the sources and the largest sources. Um, we get waterborne disease. We get contaminated drinking water wells. A lot of a lot of these communities where this pollution is happening are on wells. You get high nitrate in those wells, and your well becomes unsafe. What concerns me the most um, is that most people, a lot of people, don't know to look for it, and they're drinking it, um, and they're not being warned about it, and. Um, so that's something that, that we think about a lot and focus on and try to figure out what we can do to help in that regard. Um, we also get massive dead zones, like the Gulf of Mexico, um, where we have all of that pollution gathering in the Mississippi River and, ru and running out. But we also have coastal dead zones um, on both coasts, east and west. Um, the impairments are kind of obvious. Recreation, we have drinking water impairments, fish and wildlife, fish kills. Um, fish advisories, shellfish advisories, and obviously aesthetic problems. Okay, these are yours. Um, so these are your CAFOs, medium CAFOs. Um, New York's a big dairy state, as I'm sure you know. To be a medium CAFO, you need 200 to 699 medium dairy, I mean, mature dairy cows. Uh, to be a large CAFO, you need 700 or more. Um, in New York, a few years ago, Waterkeeper Alliance and Earth Justice and some other groups um, challenged the New York permit in court and won um, the Clean Water Act permit. And, and the court said, you know, identified the ways in which it was coming up short one of those ways was uh, New York was not requiring the CAFOs to submit their nutrient management plans for review and make them available for the public so they'd show how they were gonna meet all these standards. What happened as a result of that was all the CAFOs that had the Clean Water Act permits decided they weren't discharging anymore. And they went to the state no discharge permit. Um, EPA records says you only have two CAFOs now that um, have Clean Water Act permits out of all of those. Um, New York DEC, in an article that I read last night, um, said there aren't any now. There were 250 at the time of that lawsuit, and now they all suddenly don't discharge, apparently. I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on that. Um, and you can imagine that that is, that is one of, in my opinion, one of the most significant problems, right? is that they're not even getting the permits that are supposed to be controlling the waste. Um, next one. You also have a lot of slaughterhouses. A lot. But you're not alone. Everybody does. I just wanted to give you a sense of that, that like why it matters that we get this right. Can you go to the next one? And so this is a little bit of close up on this area because I was going to be here. Um, uh, the boundary there in purple is the core area that Save the River focuses on. Did I get it right? Um, uh, the little brown things are all the CAFOs around it. And what I want you to see is, um, and the, the red dots are slaughterhouses. So you can see that um, these, these, I mean, it's hard to get away from water here, I imagine. But it's, it's not unique here. The CAFOs tend to be located close to water, and they tend to be grouped around or near slaughterhouses. And so you get this concentration of waste all in one place. And 
systems are not set up to deal with it because they're not treating their waste and because there are no standards that are being applied to them to really control it. Now, I, to be fair, um, the state no discharge permit does have some standards, um, but this is a problem all across the country. The state no discharge permits are not really no discharge permits. They're, they're, they're releasing pollutants through the standard ways, through the groundwater, like I mentioned, through the runoff, um, through the air. Um, but anyway, this, is, this gives you a sense of what it looks like around here. Um, I, and then I looked at one that has been in the news, just so you could get a little bit closer. We'll get even closer, but you know this is this is close to here. Um, there's a dairy CAFO. It's a large dairy CAFO. And go back one. Um, a large dairy CAFO. It has um, 1,200 mature dairy cows and 1,080 dairy um, cows, and um, in that small looking facility and it is bounded by land, which could be land application sites. That would be typical, I don't know. Um, but then you also have these streams that run through and direct the whatever is coming off those facilities down and um, toward the um, St. Lawrence River. So if you scroll in. Um, this is from 2018 this aerial image, um, you can see the lagoon, um, which does not visually to me, look like it has a liner. It looks like it has a soil liner to me. Um, you also see another waste storage system of some sort um, in between the barns there. And then this other pit over here. Um, and then for the land application site, you can see when uh, it looks like a land application site, I really don't know, but the field that's a part of um, the dairy operation, you can see that you have these sort of flow paths going across the field that you can visually see. And then you have the, some historic stream flow paths. And anyway, I just wanted to show you that just so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a CAFO. That's what, they, that's what a dairy CAFO typically looks like. Um, next slide. Okay. so. Um, we also, Food and Water Watch and then Waterkeeper Alliance and Earth Justice and about 50 of our friends, we all, we, we filed petitions with the EPA to get them to fix this problem. Um, Food and Water Watch did, they, they had litigation related to it. We, we were just asking them to do a better job regulating the largest CAFOs. Make them get permits. And um, they responded by denying our petitions um, and saying that they were going to study the problem. So um, that's better than nothing, I guess. So, um, so they're in the process of doing that right now. And they're forming a subcommittee and looking for people to serve on the subcommittee to give them advice about it. Um, it there's a chance that they'll do something. And so I, I wanted to highlight this for you all that this is something that's just now getting started. And I hope uh, that we're able to give them good input about what's wrong and ideas about what can fix it from all kinds of people with all kinds of expertise, um, because it's really important to a lot of people all across the country that they do better. Um, we did a survey of 75 water keepers across the country to find out what they thought about the system because we wanted to know is it the same everywhere i believe it is i've worked in a lot of the places and i see the same thing over and over again but we asked them and so as you click through this it should um should come up so uh the number one problem they said was a lack of enforcement of our existing standards um Inadequate state regulatory programs, so these non-discharge programs, the ones that are not the Clean Water Act programs, those are inadequate and not controlling the pollution. Uh, water quality monitoring is not required at a lot of these facilities, almost, uh, uh, it's very common. Um, total maximum daily loads, which is the Clean Water Act's um, way of addressing lo pollutant loading, um, are not treating even the discharging facilities as point sources. And the reason that matters is that only point sources get the limits placed on them. So when you call something a non-point source, when it's really a point source, what happens is 
all you get to do is ask them to sign up to volunteer to do better, typically. Um, so that's a huge problem. The lack of per permitting, which we talked about, and then a lot of the EPA standards are inadequate in, in multiple ways. Okay, um, go ahead. Um, there's also regulatory gaps and exclusions that are built into the Clean Water Act and the EPA's regulations. Um, there is a massive lack of transparency, public transparency. So you can, you know, live next to one and not be able to find out what's going on with the pollution there in a lot of places. Um, uh, standards over, allow over application of waste, which I covered. And did I get all of them? I think I did. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're interested, EPA has a landing page where they're, you know, talking about that this work that they're doing and they need to hear from people who care about it. And there will be more and more opportunities as they go through this process. And, and I didn't mean to imply that I don't think it's a meaningful process that EPA is getting ready to engage in. I feel like I did with my face because my face gives away various thoughts I have, I think sometimes, but I really, I do think it's meaningful. I do think it's a, an opportunity that we've needed for a really long time to get EPA to really look at this and for them to really listen and be willing to do something about it. And I, I, I'm hopeful and I think that it's um, very likely that that's where we are right now. And I don't think we'll get one again for a long time, so I'm hoping people can engage. And then my last thing that I wanted to talk about is slaughterhouses. So um, we also sued the EPA for not updating the slaughterhouse standards with a bunch of, of other groups, uh, Earth Justice and Environmental Integrity Project and some water keepers and some others. Um, and we um, entered into a settlement agreement that required them to update those standards in December. And they did, they made a proposal to update the standards. Um, unfortunately, they, the proposal that they made um, to update the standards is um, not as good as it needs to be. Um, so option one is their preferred option, and it would only put nitrogen and phosphorus limits on direct dischargers. So out of 3,800, roughly 3,879 facilities, they're only gonna put nitrogen and phosphorus limits on 125 of them. They're the biggest direct dischargers. For those indirect dischargers, the ones that go to wastewater treatment systems, they're gonna just put some limits on oil and, oil and grease and fat and that sort of stuff. Um, and, but they luckily uh, put two other options in their proposal that do a better job. That first one, you can see um, option one would only reduce uh, nitrogen loading across the country by 10%. Um, remember, they're the largest, sec second largest nitrogen, largest phosphorus source. Um, and then phosphorus would only go down by 37%. But they also pr proposed option three, which would put limits on um, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus on a few more of the large dischargers <laughs> The large, there's only 171 large direct dischargers. So they get fairly close with this proposal. Um, and then they would put nitrogen and phosphorus limits for the first time in history on, on pretreatment facilities, those indirect dischargers. And so that he, rulemaking is going on right now. They just had a public hearing. They're having another one next week in, in DC. We've asked them to have more and to have more hearings in communities that are impacted because community members can't go to DC to talk to them and they need to come to them, in my opinion. So I hope, I'm hopefully they will do that or at least some more virtual options. They had the, the hearing the day after the notice was published in the Federal Register, which is not enough notice for people. Um, and we're gonna be engaging, comments are gonna be, be due on, I think it's March 24th, March 24th, 60-day um, comment period um, for people to comment. Um, it's kind of hard. It's a technical issue. We're, gonna, we're working on it really hard to dig into the technical details and be able to provide comments. Um, there will be opportunities to join citizen comments if you're interested. I, I'll share that information with Save the River. 
um, and you all can say share it too. Um, and uh, there's um, there's also an action alert on Waterkeeper Alliance's page where if you want to file a comment, you can as well through that system. So anyway, that's everything I have. I, I think I talked too long, but thank you all for letting me be here and speak to you about it. Right, it's really complicated, right? Because um, in some places, in some places, um, sport fishermen, they love extra nutrients because it it decreases, uh, it increases sport fish at first until they all die. <laughs> it's good till it's not. Till it's not. Um, uh, the other the other challenge, I don't think sports sportsmen are the are our big problem. I didn't mean to imply that, but. But it is a problem because people see it as a beneficial when your fish populations or sport fish populations are healthy. Um, the other problem is we call it nutrients. People think nutrients are a good thing. And so then you say, well, okay, well, I'll call it nitrogen and phosphorus. Pe people don't know uh, what to do with that. Um, I don't have an answer to your question about how to how to help um, people engage on the issue. And I have an anecdote about it. When I first started working, um, being an environmental lawyer, I did a lot of hazardous substance work, super fun sites. I, I did some criminal prosecutions even. And somebody came to me and said, we have a massive nutrient problem. And I went, I mean, okay. Um, it, it doesn't sound and then I became obsessed, as you might have noticed, when I figured it out. It doesn't sound bad. And so I don't know how to, to make it, to convey it in a way that, that resonates with more people. Um, we need to, you're right, I think it's really important and it's something that we're working through and trying to find ways. Um, and I wish I had an answer for you. Um, there are a lot of people working on exactly that aspect of it as well. I, I can't answer, that's, that's the question of the century, right? Like, how do we produce food in a, in a different and better way than we do right now? Um, uh, there are lots of ways. Um, it's a complicated answer. Um, I can tell you what I do personally. I mean, you, I, consumer choice is a huge part of it. You know, supporting 
supporting people who produce in different ways in in more sustainable ways is is a part of the solution um i'd be happy to follow up with you after this to share more but the answer to your question about how to transform agriculture i can't do on the fly standing up here <laughs> Um, when I when I say it, I'm thinking I, of um, periods of time when um, you're you have anoxic conditions in places like um, Pamlico Tar Sound in North Carolina or the Cape Fear estuary. Um, they're not dead zones like the Gulf of Mexico in that sense, but they're are anoxic conditions that are not conducive to aquatic life that are that are happening there. We've also had a problem with anoxic conditions in the Chesapeake Bay as well, associated with algal blooms. Uh, Chesapeake Bay, north or south? Um, north or south? South, I guess. I don't know. I'm not a Chesapeake Bay expert. Um, I've worked on it a little bit, but I don't want to. I don't want to guess like where in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, anoxic um, conditions occur, and I'm not up to date. They've done a lot of work on the Chesapeake Bay um, and reduced inputs a lot. What I don't know is um, how much, what effect that has had in the real world. I haven't looked at it recently. I know, um, I have looked at the um, Albemarle Tar Pamlico Sound recently, and that's a place where, it's one of the first places where we did the, the reduced loading approach. Um, the, the one in the Chesapeake Bay is better, but that's one of the first places that it was done. And um, loading has not gone down at all um, there. And so we still have the same problems. The cities have reduced their inputs, but when we don't control all of those CAFOs that are uh, swine CAFOs in North Carolina that are pushing in um, really uh, significantly or the slaughterhouses you still have these massive sources and it and it um that's why i say they've done a better job in the chesapeake bay is because they did start maybe not all the way to get at some of those sources and in, in a few different ways um on the west coast um when i was speaking about that i was thinking about there there are, are massive algal bloom problems and shellfish bed closures up and down the coast um, what I was thinking of when I was talking about it was the one in the Puget Sound area. Um, they struggle, um, in particular, there's some shellfish beds up in the northern part of Washington state where there's a huge concentration of dairies and they struggle with, with shellfish closures and anoxic conditions and that sort of thing. And that's what I meant. I mean, I don't know if it's fair to call all of those dead zones, but what but if you call if you by dead zone you mean anoxic conditions then then that's where I, they are